Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. And this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and give you your whole Bible back. Now, we are just absolutely prepared. We have our venti sugar-free vanilla lattes from Starbucks sitting right here in front of us <laughs> so that uh, we can have a little bit of wake up. Uh, after a long night, we visited with our friends uh, Ron and Johnny Reed here in uh, Las Vegas. And their uh, kids. And their, their children. Let's see, it's Cassie and um, Rodney. Rodney. And Jennifer, Jennifer their, another, their, Jennifer. Mm-hmm. another one of their uh, daughters, not not actually related, but a daughter nonetheless, and uh, had a wonderful time. Uh, Ron and Johnny are just uh, real columns in the purposes of God here in the city, mm-hmm. and they do a lot of good work. <coughs> they, they go down on Fremont Street, and I don't even know what that is, but old I know town. there's needy people there right, that town. they go down and minister to. And uh, and other things that they do. We had a great meeting with them uh, on the Jericho Drive, and we're going to be doing a few other uh, meetings. Not a just real heavy schedule, but a strategic one yeah. in uh, Las Vegas uh, this week before we return home. Uh, my weather bug says it's 37 degrees back in Branson. Well, I don't know what it is here this morning, but I don't think it's that cool. <laughs> it's not. Uh, but we're not putting our toes in the sand. Not this week. Uh, when we were in Mexico uh, recently, it was like 95. And uh, we looked at the little weather bug, and it said back in Branson, it was, or actually the Springfield Airport, it was 8 degrees. In the, and somehow it just makes those southern climates much more enjoyable, enjoyable when it's really cold back home. Although I, I'm not wishing it on them. No. <laughs> we just take what Father hands us on. Thank you, Father. <laughs> so today we are studying in Numbers chapter 31 and uh, y'all be praying those of you that that tune in uh, good morning Bonnie good morning Barbara Ann Hi. Uh, those of you that tune in regularly be praying for me that that God would give me the time help me have the wisdom to find the time <clears throat> for what I want to do is is I want to go back and take Genesis and um, Exodus, and now we have Leviticus and Numbers, and I want to take these studies and compile them into books that we're then going to publish. Genesis, a prophetic perspective. Exodus, a prophetic, <coughs> a prophetic perspective, etc. So that by the time we get through this, we'll have a complete daily Bible study of the entire Bible. And then we'll publish them on paperback. But I've got to find the time to get that done. So say a prayer uh, for us that 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 could uh, happen. It's amazing to me. I saw we had a dropout of our sound uh, yesterday. Here we are in probably one of the most technologically advanced locales (laughs) on the earth. And the Internet is just somewhat lagging. Uh, the same thing in Western Europe. Now we're just talking, you know, go fix you a cup of coffee while we're having our little chat. Our morning chat. Uh, good morning, Michelle. Good Barbara morning, Ann. Michelle. Uh, the, uh, when we were in Europe, I, I mean, I thought, man, the Internet is going to be just Johnny on the spot. It'll be great. And everywhere we went in Europe. But we find that's true uh, as we travel uh, even in hotels, you, you check into uh, uh, a hotel. We try to average a three-star hotel. We kind of found out that uh, economizing for Jesus is sometimes unbelief. Uh, you don't get crazy about it, but you know you do stay in a decent place. And and even in really nice places, the internet is is lagging. And but yet at home we've got a good connection, and so we have to make adjustments. And sometimes there's technological difficulties in the broadcast because we're broadcasting from another locale. Thanks for being patient yesterday. I appreciate it. <laughs> in Numbers chapter 31, I see um, a message of defeating the Midianites in your life. In this chapter, God instructs Moses to go to war against the Midianites who attempted to seduce Israel with idolatry in the wilderness of Zin. Uh, the Midianites worshipped Baal whose name means 
dominative father. Is that descriptive of any uh, church leaders you've ever seen? Dominative father? The name Midian means strife and contention. There is a time in your life to reject sources of strife and contention and to refuse to commit idolatry with those who think you need to submit yourself to heavy-handed, dominating spiritual leadership. Amen. After defeating the Midianites, the spoil is not only divided to the warriors in this chapter, but it's also divided to those that stayed behind. <clears throat> Please excuse me. A true spiritual warrior knows that their conquests are not only to their own benefit, but are shared as spoil to those who support and pray for them as well. When God uh, puts Kitty and I out there doing some of these radical things that we've been called upon to do, we're not only breaking ground for ourselves, we're breaking ground for you. That's right. And we see that in the testimonies. People come back and say, my life has been changed. Why? It's something. It's a transaction in the spirit that, that as we take new territory, you gain new ground. We take new territory, you gain new ground, your life is different because we're all in this together. That's right. Uh, so, Kitty, mm -hmm. this is a long chapter, uh, but we're going to be uh, reading larger portions of it uh, as uh, we go along. If you would read verse 1 through verse, verse 12. 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites, after thou shalt be gathered unto thy people. <coughs> and Moses spake unto the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves unto war, and let them go against the Midianites, and avenge the Lord of Midian. Of every tribe a thousand, throughout all the tribes of Israel, shall ye send to, to the war. So there were delivered out of thousands of Israel a thousand of every tribe, twelve thousand armed for war. And Moses sent them to war, a thousand of every tribe of them, and Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, to go to war with the holy instruments. Excuse me. <coughs> it's early. <coughs> early in Las Vegas. And the trumpet to blow in his hand. And they warred against the Midianites, as the Lord commanded Moses, and they slew all the males. And they slew the king of Midian, beside the rest of them that were slain, namely Evi, and Rechem, and Zer, and Hur, and Reba, five kings of Midian. Midian. Sorry, Midian. Balaam also, the son of Bor, they slew with the sword. And the children of Israel took all the women of Midian captive, and their little ones, and took the spoil of their cattle, and of all their flocks, and all their goods, and they burnt all their cities wherein they dwelt in their goodly castles with fire. And they took, <clears throat> they took the spoil and all the prey, both of, both of men and of beasts. And they brought the captives and the prey and the spoil unto Moses and Eleazar the priest, and unto the congregation of the children of Israel, unto the camp of the plains of Moab, which are by Jordan near Jericho. Now you notice that Balaam is, is executed Jewish... <laughs> Boy, me too. It's the latte we're drinking. <laughs> Jewish commentators say that Balaam was not only slain by the sword, but he was beheaded, burned, strangled, and hung. <laughs> and all four forms of legal execution under Moses' uh, law. Uh, they really didn't like Balaam. Uh, and not only that, but uh, they claimed that God took the power of prophecy from the Gentile nations because of Balaam. Now, I beg to differ with them on that, but no, nonetheless. So in this chapter, the Lord instructs Moses to exact consequences on the Midianites for hiring the prophet Balaam to curse the nation of Israel. To a peace-loving person, this chapter can be very disconcerting to read. Uh, but let's ask the deeper question. What is the deeper message so that we can see in this chapter that is so important to God that he included it in the account that reaches us thousands of years later? Remember, uh, this is not first and foremost history. This, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians, Paul made the statement that these things were recorded as examples to us on whom the ends of the age have come. In other words, they are type, metaphor, shadow, and allegory 
given to us. They're saying something to us that is beyond just history. Now, I'm not suggesting that they are myth, although you'll see the school of higher criticism in theology. I just love the fact we have some theologians that connect in this Bible uh, study uh, because I know you, you understand some of these things I refer to. But they, there are those that believe that's all they are is myth, that there's no history in them at all. I believe they're very historical. There's, there's very accurate historicity. And it's interesting that archaeology many times will uncover the exactitude uh, with which the account in the Bible is reliable. And one day, uh, I'm thinking about next year, beginning to do a study of that, where we get our Bible, how the Western world in academia approaches the Bible. It's very interesting. It's very compelling, and it would be a, a real benefit uh, to you. But let's look at what is the example? What is the, the med metaphor? What is the allegory, the typology that God is giving? The word Midian or the Midianite means strife and contention. So when God sends Moses and the children of Israel, he said it's time to go after strife and contention. And uh, when the, the Midianites could not successfully curse Israel through Balaam, if you read, go back and read, we just covered this in previous chapters, they sent their own daughters into the camp to seduce the people to worship Baal through ritual prostitution. Uh, now, again, if you've got a spiritual mind, you start looking at the, the, that was how that spirit operated then, back among an ancient people. How does it operate in the modern church culture today? The spirit of Baal is, and the Midian principle are, strong, are alive and well. You can see the Baal-Jezebel uh, strategy very prevalent in our churches. Baal means dominative father. Jezebel means daddy's little girl. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. You ever see somebody who, who uh, backs up and runs interference for a church leader because they have that little place, like you, I have a place with the leader that you don't have. Many times leaders surround themselves with a cadre of, of little special helpers that, that run interference for, for that man's flesh mm. and, and keep fostering and advocating this dominative, manipulative uh, form of leadership. I mean, they say, well, do we always have to talk about that? Yes, we do, because it's right. largely <laughs> definitive of church culture today, and God wants it just to be pointed out. We don't want to do it, no, it that way anymore. That's right. <laughs> Help us, Lord. Help us, God. Mm -hmm. So this is the Baal-Jezebel strategy, and it's very prevalent in our culture. Baal, again, he's a false god whose name means dominative father. We tend to seek out larger than life leaders that have more in common with the cult of celebrity than with the humble servant leaders of the Bible. They prey upon our insecurities, they strut themselves before us while they step on toes and preach hard messages. They wait in the wings and they don't come out on the platform till after the worship service. And they leave immediately after they're through speaking and turn the after service over to their underlings to hold an altar call. And uh, you know, I've seen it. And they come in with four bodyguards, you know, four big old boys on uh, one on each side, so you can't get anywhere uh, near them. Uh, it's interesting that the messages that they preach, uh, very hardcore, denunciatory messages, but they all seem to apply to someone other than the people that are listening. And so it provokes in the people of God this condemnatory attitude. Yes, harumph, we are the people of God. We're not like all them dirty sinners. Huh, sounds uh, like a scripture we read in the New Testament. <clears throat> see, this is a stronghold. The stronghold of Midian, the stronghold of strife and contention, uh, the, which creates a party spirit. Right. Well, I, I am of Reading. I'm not saying Reading does this, but I see people do this a lot. Well, I flow in the Reading camp. Well, I flow in the glory of Zion camp. 
my profit's bigger than your profit. Oh, my. <laughs> and they don't mean to do it, but yet it's the culture of, it's a spiritual culture of our church. Yeah. <clears throat> the stronghold that a leader with the Baal spirit builds, and please understand, this is what I'm saying, what I'm not saying. I'm not saying Chuck Pierce or um, the Bethel. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Bill Johnson, Bill Johnson moves in that. I don't. I don't say that at all. I'm just making a point. Uh, they all seek to ally themselves. These leaders with Baal spirits will seek to ally themselves with prophets who prophesy negative things. If you go back and look, when the king tried to get Baal, Balaam, the prophet, to prophesy, he was not telling Balaam to prophesy good things. He wanted Balaam to denounce the people. Now think about that. If you've ever heard people describe or leaders describe, and pastors, even pastors who don't accept the prophetic, when they teach on the prophetic, they paint a picture of Elijah calling down fire from heaven. Prophets deal with things. Prophets address the sins of the people. Prophets beat down the transgressors. Uh, really? Well, what do you do with the verse where uh, they rejected Jesus and the uh, disciples said, do you want us to call down fire from heaven like Elijah? He turned around, he rebuked them. He says, you don't know what spirit you're of. I did not come to destroy, but to save. So what did he do? In that very statement, he reconfigured the prophetic. He said, the prophetic, you're not, he said, you are looking at it from an old covenant paradigm, but I'm establishing a new paradigm that eventually became known as the new covenant. Uh, uh, one of mercy and blessing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1-3, through 3, says that the prophetic, <laughs> including the office of the prophet, is for edification, exhortation, and comfort. And if you are not uh, connected with a prophet, or if you as a prophet are not moving in edification, exhortation, and comfort, if you step outside that profile, you have stepped outside the New Testament paradigm that Jesus established for the prophetic, and you have gone out beyond your anointing. Say, well, people dropped dead in the New Testament. Yes, they did, but it wasn't prophets that they were connected with when that happened. Amen. And the apostles that it did happen around were as alarmed about what was taking place as anybody else. <laughs> and yes, but we turned people over to the devil for the destruction of their flesh to the saving of their soul. Yeah, and the guy that did that in the New Testament... <laughs> Never did it again. That's right. Because very shortly after he did it, he starts complaining that there was a messenger from Satan sent to buffet him. <laughs> in other words, he was operating in the law of sowing and reaping, but he learned later to ascend into the law of love. And it's interesting that Paul mentored so many apostles, and there is no record in the Bible or in the second century church histories that anybody ever turned someone over to the devil for the destruction of their flesh again because they saw what happened to Paul. Mm -hmm. So you have to realize when you go through the book of Acts that the word love does not appear one time. And these guys were walking it out. For all their power, they were not the apostles at the end of their lives that they were at the beginning of their lives. They had to grow in their sure. gifting and in their understanding. It didn't come with a manual being no. an apostle. <laughs> and people, you know, I've had people point their finger at, at us. And one guy called me up. He said, you're going to die. <laughs> I laughed. I said, okay, you just made a prediction that will come to pass one day unless Jesus intervenes. When am I going to die? Soon. So I flipped out my day timer. Okay, soon. Uh, let me see. Five years? No, that's not soon. Let's back it off. Let's say, let's, let's give God some time. Uh, let's give the word some time to come to pass. How about three years? If I'm not dead in three years and I come back to you, are you going to admit and repent because you don't know what spirit you're of? We're not talking about me. We're talking about you. I turn you over to the devil. I said, look. I'm not concerned about the losing team. Don't turn me over to the devil. Turn me over to God. He's bigger, and I trust him. Do you trust him? <laughs> you know, the sad epitaph to that story is when that man made those statements, he didn't release death on me, but he made a covenant with death in his own bloodline, and his only grandchild died Certainly. sudden infant death syndrome shortly after. That had nothing to do with Russ Walden. 
It had absolutely, God was not vindicating me or defending uh-huh. us at all. It was something that man opened himself up to because he's playing with fire. This dueling pistols. I turn you over to the devil. No, I turn you over to the devil. My anointing's <laughs> bigger than your anointing. Who was it said we're not God's sheriff, so turn in your badge and Bob hang, up, hang up your six guns or yeah. something? Bob Mumford says we are, he, well, he said it of himself. He said, I am not God's sheriff. sheriff. Yeah. He said, if you think you are, shoot your horse. <laughs> turn in your ba- uh, turn in your badge and give up your six guns, because I like what Kenneth Copeland's son wrote a little thing about his dad uh, for Father's Day. He said these are thing, ten things my dad taught me, and one of them was it's not my job to correct anybody. Mm-hmm. And does does correction need to come? Let me tell you something. <clears throat> we have a lot of people very close to us that would receive correction, and uh, I I just won't. Uh, it, it, they have to. I never answer a question I haven't been asked, and even when I at, when I'm asked, I really hesitate. I am not quick to correct someone, and when I do, uh, Kitty and I'll sit there and say, "Okay." Now, the first thing we need to point out is you asked. Yeah. You asked. Therefore, we're going to, and we proceed with, with fear and trembling, That's because. Right. Uh, if, that's an apostolic call. You said that to me one time. That's the that's the signs of the apostle rising up when people are ready to ask you because they really are ready for change for the most part. Then they get the change that they are pursuing. You no, know, the prophetic brings the overture of God's <laughs> word to you. But when you start interacting with an apostle, there is a real level of accountability there. That's right. And uh, and Ananias and Sapphira found out about that, you know. And of course, yes, revival's coming, and it'll be the days of Ananias and Sapphira. But nobody's volunteering. Mm-mm. How come the idea? This is the Baal spirit, folks. How come the idea we have in our church culture of of outpouring of God's spirit is always connected with Ananias and Sapphira? If you can't raise them from the dead, you you. How come you're so uh, hot and bothered about seeing them drop dead? Come on. Let's let's forget about seeing them drop. You know, it doesn't take like my dad says, doesn't take any talent to to ruin your life. You know, it doesn't it doesn't take. We don't need the anointing to be sick, broke, and die before our time. How about the anointing to be raised from the dead, blessed, favored to God? Because mm-hmm. we do want people to repent. Romans two four five says it's the goodness of God that leads men to repent. And all this harumph, beating the pulpit stepping on toes, pointing out the ills of society. The ills of society run rampant in in our culture are an indication of the anemia, spiritual anemia of the church. The world has always been wicked. We've known that. It's just that the light of the church has become so dim that the world does not fear us any longer. So let's just get back to God. Let's repent. How do we repent? It's the goodness of God that leads us to repent. In other words... Uh, if uh, it, it, nobody ever repented sitting there beating them upside the head. If you want them to repent, go give them God's goodness. Isn't that obnoxious? Mm-hmm. Isn't that disgusting? You don't want to be nice to those people. <clears throat> but that's the plan of God. You don't want to be nice to the belligerent. You don't want to be nice to people that are rubbing your nose in their lifestyle, in their choices, and, and mocking you and mocking your God. You want to rail on them. But go ahead and you'll get something out of it, but it's not the purpose of God. Mm-hmm. If you want them to repent, give them God's goodness. Reconcile them to God. Get them as close to God as they can get this side of a new birth experience. And then Jesus... <laughs> I hear you, Michelle. And, and Jesus... We have people that do ask us that. Thank you, uh, uh, Jesus, you arrange the introductions by bringing them as close to Jesus as they can get this side of a new birth experience. Right. And then he arranged, He takes it from there. The redemption part is up to him. <laughs> so we see in this chapter that there is a, also a time to go to war against the Midianite principle in our lives, strife and contention. The Midianites preyed on the vulnerabilities of the people and seduced them to idolatry and compromise. Mm-hmm. There does come a time that you have to set aside hesitancy and put your foot down against those people in your life that are manipulating you and they want you to come under the leadership who's your covering uh, the same one the Pope answers to Amen. <laughs> see one thing I found out growing up in church culture is that uh, pastors for the most part uh, they don't have pastors 
And I'm not saying it's supposed to be that way. But pastors, I learned a long time ago that pastor, pastors, the culture of church leadership is they have to maintain themselves. They're on their own recognizance. That's why they do so well. That's why they're so strong. They have to be responsible for themselves. Who was that? I missed the phrase of who it was. Who's responsible? Pastors. Pastors are on responsible. On their own recognizance. Yeah. Yes. So why, do, why do pastors do so well? I mean, sometimes pastors really mess up, but for the most part, they get it on with God most of their life. How do they do that? They take responsibility for themselves. Yes, yeah, my fault, my responsibility. But then they tell you you're not going to make it without them. Huh. Hello. <laughs> well, who, who are they making it without? Oh, yes, I have a covering. Mo oh, really? Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's test that theory. <laughs> so read verses 13 through 24, please. 24. <laughs> and Moses and Eli, uh, Eleazar the priests and all the princes of the congregation went forth to meet them without the camp. And Moses was wroth with the officers of the host, with the captains over the thousands and captains over the hundreds which came from the battle. And Moses said unto them, Have ye all saved the women alive? Okay, so they had the battle now. He sent them out. <clears throat> they had the battle. They're coming back with the captains. Go ahead. Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Now therefore kill every male among the little ones, and, the, and kill every woman that hath known man by lying with him. But all the women and children that have not known, known a man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. And do ye abide with them, and... And do ye abide without the camp seven days. Whosoever hath killed any person, whosoever has touched any slain, purify both yourselves and your captives on the third day and on the seventh day. And purify your raiment and all that is made of skin, and all the work of goat's hair, and all the things made of wood. And Eleazar the priest said unto the men of war, which went to battle, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord commanded Moses. Only the gold and silver, the brass, the iron, the tin and the lead, everything that may abide the fire, ye shall go, ye shall make it go through the fire, and it shall be clean. Nevertheless, it shall be purified with the water of separation, and all that abideth not the fire, ye shall take, ye shall make uh, go through the water, and ye shall wash your That's clothes. That's the water mixed with the ashes of the red heifer we talked about. The right. waters in separation. Right. And he sh oh, and ye shall wash your clothes on the seventh day, and ye shall be clean, and afterward ye shall come into the camp. Okay. Now, this is really hard to read. You understand they kill babies. <clears throat> kill all the little ones. Why would they do that? Jesus. You have to remember, these children were conceived in the act of ritual prostitution. These children were conceived on the altars of Baal. Jesus. They were conceived in idolatry. Mm. Now you think about that a minute. And let's make the application for today. Dominative leaders who say, they quote that verse, unless you're faithful in that which is another man's, who's going to give you that which is your own? Mm -hmm. And they tell you that your ministry will not launch or be birthed until you come into alignment with their dominative leadership. What are they trying to do? They're trying to get you to conceive your ministry on the altars of a dominative leader. Mm -hmm. And what happens? Those things have to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. How many churches have been birthed from a split? How many ministries have been birthed in a, a environment controlled by the Midianites of strife and contention? Right. We're in strife. We got a beef with the leader. I feel called to go into the ministry myself. What is that? That's being conceived on the altars of Baal. Because of whom you are overcome of, the same are you brought into bondage. Better to forgive that dominative leader, get cleansed in your spirit, and then go find out what God wants you to do. That's good, Don't huh? launch your ministry as a reaction, because then you are just simply uh, uh, conceiving a, a, uh, a call in your mind that will only go out and reproduce the very thing that you've come away from. Right, it's fracture. We've seen many do that that have a... That's their foundation. It starts with a fracture in it. Well, who needs that? You don't need to start out with a fracture. I remember one guy, he was just notorious for building large churches out of splits. He would mm. go into a church and, and become a, a, a part of the leadership, and then he would split that congregation, and then he'd, made, he'd make a statement. 
he would say, I wasn't stirring up trouble. I was just ministering to a few wounded sheep. And if I named his name, you'd know him. And, and man, it just broke my heart. Something, I, it's like, ain't nothing wrong, but something ain't right. Mm -hmm. Something there is not correct. You have to defeat, you have to go after strife and contention. How do you defeat strife and contention? If you choose to have no opinion, then you have just taken all the oxygen out of the room and strife and contention cannot breathe. <coughs> you know, they can't. Someone, if you're not going to get into strife, did you hear what happened at church Wednesday night? No, and I don't want to hear is my answer. And see, I know, and I don't want to hear. <laughs> did you know that the pastor and the board of elders did they're going to do this what do you think about that oh uh, excuse me i have said these words i'd say excuse me uh, you must have an opinion about me that you you must think i'm somebody whose opinion matters who am i have you looked at my life have you looked at my need of a savior have you looked at how needy i am i am in no position to judge Amen. that man and you got to remember this is the guy who used to get up and, and pray, you know, anoint my TV and pray that Charles Capps, Kenneth Hagen, PTL would go off the air. <laughs> God forgave him, though. Thank you, Lord. See, you need, if you're going to slay the Midianites, you, you have to go for the throat. Don't just stomp on their toe. You'll just make them mad. Don't throw ro the rocks back at them that they're throwing at you. It's like King David. King David, when he was serving King Saul, he was the only man in Israel who didn't know what to do when a javelin was thrown at him. King Saul would throw the javelin at David, and David would just, you know, he would just, he didn't have to stand there and take it. He said he would avoid out of the out of Saul's presence, uh, but he never picked up the javelin and threw it back. See, you have to to deal it uh, uh, with these things. Otherwise, if you don't. Uh, you're going to wind up conceiving a ministry on the altars of Baal. And those things that are conceived on the altars of Baal have to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And many people go out and they build ministries. And God lets them uh, build their ministries to a great uh, place. But then they wonder why it falls apart. Because they were on a, uh, on a foundation that was contaminated. That's why Paul said, woe unto me if I build on another man's foundation. He understood this principle. You know, we, you have a man called an apostle, but he's always building on somebody else's foundation. Mm -hmm. And so they're just simply reworking old foundations. That's not apostolic ministry, folks. Mm -hmm. One of the marks of an apostle, <laughs> Paul said, woe be unto me if I build on anywhere else but bare ground. If I'm building on another man's foundation, and you wonder, and I did that for years. As a pastor, pastoring in denominational churches that had been started by somebody else. And can I tell you what a headache it was? It was a headache for me. It was a headache for the people I was pastoring. I didn't get them. They didn't get me. Whenever I would try and take the people on in God, they put their foot down like stepchildren. You ain't my daddy. <laughs> How come you don't preach like uh, Brother Hightower? How come you don't? <laughs> and, and I'm just, oh, help me, Jesus. <laughs> And I knew, I understood the problem. I'm like, God, when are you gonna God, when are you gonna get me out of here? You know? But I think he had to get the bail out of me before he got me out of the bail. Uh, hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he had to get the Midianite out of me before he could get me out of Midian. And then one day he gave me the opportunity. You know, he after much breaking, you know, he said, Are you willing to go out all the way out, if necessary, where people don't even think you're a Christian to find my will, to walk with me? Yes, Lord, I think I yeah, well, we're gonna test that theory, he told me. And, you know, most of those people in that time in my life would look at us today and they don't even think we're believers. <laughs> I mean, they, they are absolutely convinced they're going to be disappointed if they see us uh, in heaven. But they'll have to love us. Something's going to be wrong with their world if they see Russ and Kitty in heaven. There's no darkness there. That's the beauty of it. <laughs> so our sense of, of fairness and justice rejects this picture of unarmed captives. Little children, kill the little ones. <laughs> Kill them while they're little, folks, because they grow. It's only one thing. I made a statement. Only one thing wrong with puppies. They grow up to be dogs. Uh, there's only one thing wrong with those little idolatries is they grow up to dominate our lives. Jesus. Kill them now. Yeah. Destroy the idols. <laughs> Destroy the idols. What's the deeper lesson? 
Remember, these are the Midianites. They represent sources of strife and contention. They advocate idolatry toward leadership and following dominative fathers rather than so humble servant leaders. The church culture today is largely contaminated with these attitudes. You want to be sensitive and understanding. You want to be gentle. And these influences know exactly how to make you hesitate. And when you hesitate, Python gets you. You know pythons? It's, uh, there's a spirit of python, and it's connected with the Balaam spirit. It will only attack slow-moving uh, targets. A python will not attack something that's on the move. Be quick. Mm -hmm. Keep moving. Amen. Keep obeying. Keep, Keep seeking forward. the kingdom. And when you do that, then you are... Uh, the only way I know to put it, you are vibrating at a frequency that the enemy cannot tune in on. Amen. But whenever you slow down and hesitate, huh. See, your mind thinks a lot slower than God's mind. So if you just put your mind, get it out of the way, and just respond to what God tells you to do, then you will move at the pace that God moves at, and Python can't catch up with you. But if you reach into what God is saying to you, pull it into your mind and start turning it around and say, huh, how are we going to forsake all and go follow him? Who's, where's my box of Cheerios going to come from? Who's going to pay my house note? And what am I, what's my family going to think? And all of a sudden, you slow down, Python gets you. Keep moving. Don't hesitate. Keep obeying. <laughs> See, when you hesitate, you're captured. You're robbed by the wiles uh, of Midian. They rob you of the favor of God. Moses said they had to be destroyed because, if you go back and read, their influence brought a plague among God's people. See, we often face powerlessness and lack of answered prayer and breakthrough, but we need to look very hard at our lives and the spiritual environment we've placed ourselves in. Have you allowed strife and contention to exist around you? Have you? Do you delight in opinionated people? who entertain you with their charismatic elocution of, of uh, judgmental opinion Jesus. about the world around him and something inside us just thrills to that. You know, charisma can be deceptive. It feels just like the anointing. That's right. But it leaves you feeling like you need to take a bath afterwards if you're real honest. True enough. Have you allowed strife and contention to exist? Do you refrain from taking the waters of separation? from these influences because family and friends are involved or that's, you know, that's my church. I've been going there all my life. Yeah, and it's been just as messed up. It was just as messed up before you got there. It'll be messed up after you leave and you know you don't belong there. And just because mama went there and daddy went there and your family members go there and everybody's going to give you grief if you leave. You can't leave this church. If you leave this church, you'll go across the railroad track, get hit by a train, go out into eternity. How We've many times it. have I heard that? You've heard it. <laughs> I'll you, well, i got to know where I'm going. No, you don't. Abraham went out, didn't know where he was going. Worked out pretty good for him. He was rich. He was very rich. God told him, a 75-year-old man told him to call himself Father of Many Nations, and nobody would dare laugh at him because he employed everybody in the valley. Right. <laughs> Dear Lord, help us. Oh, my goodness. Yes, I've heard that one too, Michelle. <laughs> See, you think, <laughs> are we not going there? You, <laughs> you, uh, you cannot move in human pity. Human empathy many times will diminish your anointing and rob you of your strength in God. There's a difference between man's idea of mercy and the compassion of Christ. Remember one time in a deliverance meeting, a drunk stumbled in. Uh, off the sidewalk in a storefront church. They were having a deliverance meeting, and he sat there, and he was three sheets to the wind, and he was listening to the teaching, and he was minding him, his manners, you know, so everybody didn't do nothing with him. And they were talking about rejection and, and all these things, and he threw back his head, and he says, Nobody loves me. Hmm. <laughs> what was he appealing to? He was appealing to human uh, compassion, human pity. There's a difference That's between right. human pity that diminishes your anointing and it's and the scripture that says Jesus moved with compassion, healed them all. Mm -hmm. Big difference because spiritual compassion, kingdom compassion, is it has a fidelity maintained in the heart of God. Human compassion has more an identity with suffering people. 
uh, even though you're in the midst of suffering, your identity and your sense of self has to be anchored in who Jesus is, seated at the right hand of the Father, not who the suffering are. It's like uh, Kenneth Copeland talked about that. They were sending missionaries to Africa, and they were saying, yes, we're ready to go live in grass huts and, and, uh, and have dirt floors. And they said, okay, we're withdrawing our, our uh, support. Why? Because if you're not going there to lift those people out of that situation, you have no business going. Build them the finest homes and so forth. He expanded on that. <laughs> Amen. You've heard that too. Yeah, I heard Brother uh, Keith Moore say it. Now, another thing we see here is that the captains of the people went out to war, and they came back with a condition that needed to be addressed. They Their approach to battle and to spoil that they chose constituted a problem that needed to be corrected. In other words, they came back and said, okay, we, we defeated everybody and we got this. Look, we got these captives. Mm -hmm. But uh, they now, in, in our culture, would say, well, they're the ones that won the battle. I guess might makes right. Whatever, you know, somebody that's successful, well, they must be doing something right. Let's let them have their, their way. Uh, we, should, we would never question a victorious general in his choices and decisions. We have the same attitude towards success. We confuse success with God's approval. And we choose our leaders and extend our fidelities toward those who are accomplished, effective, and prosperous. This can be very misleading. In all of our travels around the world, Kitty and I have loving relationships with people of all walks of life. Amen. We have spiritual children in the projects of East St. Louis, and we have ministered in the homes of some of the most affluent people you could imagine. You know, the wealthy are in just as great a need spiritually as the poorest Amen. believers we've ever met. Amen. And looking into the lives of some of those who are icons of success, some people that are among the upper echelons of the accomplished in this country, I've I've not often thought, wow, I would just love to be what be like they are and have what they have. I wouldn't trade with them for nothing because they have such a deep need of the Savior, Amen. just like the rest of us. Mm. Just because they're accomplished, just because they're successful doesn't mean they don't need guidance. And so Moses, what did he do? He corrected. He said, look, let me help you sort some things out. Yes, you've won a victory, but there's some things that you've gained that are going to cause you a problem. You need to deal with Midian. You need to deal with this concept of dominative leadership, with this idolatry. You need to get the false prophets dealt with. And if you read the rest of the, the chapter, chapter from 25 on. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the sum of the prey that was taken, both of man and of beast, thou and Eleazar the priest, of the chief fathers of the congregation, and divide the prey into two parts between them that took the war upon them, who went out to battle between all the congregation, and Levi the tribute unto the Lord of the men of war which went out to battle, one soul of five hundred, both of persons and of beeves, and of asses and of sheep, take it of their half, and give it to Eleazar the priest for heave offering of the Lord. And the children of Israel's half, thou shalt take one portion of fifty of the persons of the beeves, the asses, and the flocks of, of all manner of beasts, and give them to the Levites, which keep the charge of the tabernacle of the Lord. And Moses and Eleazar the priests did as the Lord commanded Moses. And the booty being the rest of the prey which the men of war had caught was six hundred thousand and seventy thousand and five thousand sheep, and threescore and twelve thousand beeves, Score and one thousand asses, and thirty and two per thousand persons in all, of women that had not known man by lying with him. And the half which was a portion of them that went out to war was in the number was in number three hundred thousand and seven and thirty thousand and five hundred sheep. That's a lot of stuff. And the Lord's tribute of the sheep was six hundred and three score and fifteen. And the beeves were thirty and six thousand, of which the Lord's tribute was threescore and twelve. The asses were thirty thousand and five hundred, of which the Lord's tribute was threescore and one. And the persons were sixteen thousand, of which the Lord's tribute was thirty and two persons. And Moses gave the tribute, which was the Lord's heave offering, unto Eleazar the priest, as the Lord commanded Moses. And the children of Israel's half, which Moses divided from the men that ward, now the half that pertained to the congregation was three hundred thousand and thirty thousand and seven thousand and five hundred sheep. 
and the thirty and six thousand beeves and the thirty thousand asses and five hundred and sixteen thousand persons even of the children of Israel's half, Moses took one portion of fifty, both of man and beast, and gave them to the Levites, which kept the charge of the tabernacle of the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. And the officers, which were over thousands of the hosts, the captains of the thousands, and the captains of hundreds, came near unto Moses. And they said unto Moses, Thy servants have taken the sum of the men of war, which are under the, our charge, and there lacketh not one man of us. We have brought therefore therefore brought an oblation for the Lord, what every man hath gotten of jewels, gold, chains, bracelets, rings, earrings, and tablets to make an atonement for our souls before the Lord. And Moses and Eleazar the priests took the gold of them, even all wrought jewels, and all the gold of the offering and that they offered up to the Lord of the captains of thousands of the captains of hundreds was sixteen thousand seven hundred and fifty shekels, for the men of war had taken spoil every man for himself. And Moses and Eleazar the priests took the gold of the captains of the thousands of, and of hundreds, and brought it into the tabernacle of the congregation for a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord. Notice that whenever they counted up the, the men, that when they went against Midian, that they didn't lose one man. And that's one of the reasons we don't fight these battles, because we think, uh, well... Uh, yes, it's a problem. Yes, it's wrong. Yes, there's strife and contention. But if I deal with it, uh, we're going to lose somebody that's important to us. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost us this relationship. It's going to, well, you can't let that be an idol. That's idolatry for sure. And whenever you go after Midian, you go after strife and contention. You go to put an end to these things. You refuse to worship Baal. You're going to, to reject everything that's been birthed in the, the, the Baal influence and the Midianite spirit, you're not going to lose when you obey God. Right. Not one. That's not right. one was lost. Yeah. And notice how they divided the spoil, that it wasn't just the men of war. It wasn't just the one that, ones out there fighting the battle. There were those that stayed behind and took care of the stuff. And then there were the Levites that were, were worshiping God. You know, sometimes you say, well... I've been out there working the soup kitchen and you're just in here in the prayer room just worshiping God. I'm doing the real work of God. Yikes. Well, that's strife and, and contention. I so appreciate Dennis Code. He's somebody we're connected with. Him and his wife, Becky. They go out there in the streets of Springfield. Amen. And they do stuff. They defy the police. They go in there and they minister to people that, that are just being run roughshod over in one of the supposedly most godly towns in, in uh, uh, the United States. But the homeless are just brutally disenfranchised. And, you know, uh, Dennis never did put me on a guilt trip. He's not God's travel agent. He, he's never booked me a guilt trip. Uh, <laughs> and I so appreciate it about them because he knows everybody has their place. Sure. So the person that's, that's interceding and spending time soaking in God's presence, uh, they're doing a very important thing. The battle out there on the battle would not be won if there are not the Levites back there worshiping the Lord and the beauty of holiness. The battle would not be won unless there was somebody back there uh, c cutting the grass, washing the dishes, and keeping the kids. And But yet when the, the men of war brought back the battle, they said, well, this is mine. No, no. Moses said, divide the spoil. See, whenever we take new territory, you gain new ground. Amen. You get that? When we, Kitty and I, we go out, we've forsaken all. You know, there's people listening to us. God's called you to forsake all and follow the Lord just like we have. But there's others of you. You have a different assignment. But guess what? When we break new, when we take new territory, you gain new ground. Mm -hmm. We all benefit. There is a spoil, folks, that is whenever uh, Kitty and I, if it's us, if we break new territory in the heavens... There's going to be a trickle down, a flow of bounty and spoil that's going to come to you, and your life is going to be different. Those who are partnered with our ministry, believing oh, God with goodness. us in ministry, absolutely. We minister to about, right about 21,000 people every day. You know, we have fewer than 150 partners. Uh, God's going to change all that. Change. The Lord's told us for about two years to really emphasize partnership, and quite honestly, uh, we You've been so busy, number one, and you're going to find the way we're supposed to do that. That's right. And uh, those of you that, mo many of you that listen, I see you come in on the chat. You, I know you already partner with us, and we appreciate it. Praise God. Uh, but uh, pray for us about that. But 
just God bless you. It's it's been good to share this word today, and I encourage you to ponder how to deal with these influences. The Baal spirit that wants to bring you under dominative leadership that says you're not right with God unless you're aligned with some dominative leader who has an opinion that you know doesn't reflect what God's telling you and what God says in his word. Those that are in strife and contention, you got to do what I say or I'm going to make you pay for it. you got to deal with that mm -hmm. and be bold and be strong and gain victory as a result of it and identify those things in your life that you're connected with that were birthed on the altars of compromise, mm -hmm. that were birthed as a reaction to something that are only going to go out and produce the very thing they decry and they, they denounce. So, Father, thank you for our lesson today. And I just pray that um, those relationships that are not godly, that don't have an intention of coming towards us in the love and the mercy of God, those ones that put their mouth on other people and other situations that do not edify, Father, I pray that you would send out, uh, out bells and whistles, red lights that flash in our spirits, that you turn up our discernment so we would know that we shouldn't be wasting our time. We're supposed Those are some that we say uh, we want to bless them, but, Father, in our hearts we want to bless them away from us because they're a distraction and a deterrent trying to slow down the pace that you've you put us on this path. Father God, and we are wanting to run this race and jump every single hurdle that we might win the prize because Jesus is the prize. So we thank you, Father. We thank you for our faithful listeners, the love we feel as we work in this ministry day by day, and we appreciate everyone. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.